Start with God's promises. That Romans 4, 20, 21, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God's able to do whatever he promised. I can't say that my faith is as strong as Abraham, but I know that this is God's word. And Ephesians 3.20 says we learn God's promise to exceedingly do abundantly above what we can ask or, or, or think. And so Heather and I can say that this is true. So tomorrow will be Mary 50 years. She's been in full-time ministry for 51 years. And I've been blessed beyond our wildest dreams for sure. So, and I want Heather to share a lot about her side of the story because you always hear from me. So, but she has her own story. So, okay, Heather, go on with your testimony. Well, I grew up in Eastern Canada. I'm a fourth generation Canadian, which not very many people can say, but my ancestors came in the 1800s to Canada and I grew up in a very ungodly home. In fact, because of the way church people had treated my mother, she never became a Christian. She remained bitter all her life towards the church. I have two sisters. One sister became a believer, and she is now with the Lord. And I have three brothers who do not know the Lord. So I'm the only other one. Um, but I came to know the Lord at a Salvation Army youth camp in Quebec. I had only gone to get away from home that weekend, but somehow even on the way to camp, I knew my life was going to change. And there through missionaries from Nigeria, I heard about Jesus Christ and about salvation. And I accepted the Lord that weekend and decided before I had even been to church or knew much of anything about the Bible, that I wanted to serve God this God that I had met. And the following year, the Lord took me to Bible school. And in my, after my second year of Bible school, I stayed on summer staff. It was a really difficult summer in many ways until the Lord really broke through in my heart to show me it's not what I could do for God, but what he wanted to do in me and through me. And that's when I had also heard about India and the troubles in India and wanting to know more what went on because the Bible school I went to had prayer meetings twice a day, every day, besides the church prayer meeting during the week. And so I wrote to Bert because he was the only one in India I knew of and asked him to send some prayer requests. And he wrote back and asked me if I would correspond with him and I thought, Lord, I don't want any man getting in the road between you and me. So it took me about three weeks to decide I would actually answer him. And on my 21st birthday, it was a Saturday. And in those days, Canada still had mail on Saturday mornings. And so I got Bert's proposal in the mail. I was now of legal age because it wasn't 18 in those days, it was 21. <laughs> so I could say yes to him. So what, what made me decide to ask Heather to uh, marry me? Um, I was in India for three years, third year. I actually was a two-year program. And India was still... Uh, was going through a lot of turbulence politically and also through communist um, influence. And so the emphasis of operation mobilization was that Canadians could go to India without visas at that time uh, as part of the Commonwealth. So they said Canadians had a special responsibility. And through India, through the prayer meetings in, India, in Prairie, my eyes were open to the needs of India. And so I heard about so many people that had never heard about Jesus. And so that, and plus the OM leaders were pushing for India. I was a Canadian and they said, if I'm not praying for India, I'm not sinning, but I'm bordering on sin. So I should get away from sin as far as possible. So I decided to try this two years. But um, 
Yes, and I thought, but well, I, one of my fears was I would never get married because I was going to be almost 25 when I got back and no Canadians would be left because they'll be all married by then. So that, I, that was my fear, but I said, I want God's will first and I want God to work in my life. And I was asked to work with the Assemblies of Brother Buck Singh. But OM had about three or four trucks going with Brother Buck Singh to help him reach out to the villages. So these trucks were foreign trucks. We drove to India overland and that was an experience in getting adjusted to India. And so then in my second year in India, I thought I, I, I by that time I attended a lot of weddings and funerals and uh, uh, and I used to even pick up wedding parties at my truck. Um, so at that time I, I uh, with my experiences of, of brothers and sisters in India and seeing what God was doing, I thought it'd be wonderful to get married in India, but no girlfriend, so it's hard to get married. But maybe one day God will supply someone who would actually marry me in India. And I didn't think, I, I even was looking at Indian young girls at my age. I was falling in love with some of them. But I thought, I don't know if uh, I can handle this. But maybe there is a Canadian still that uh, is out there. And I was praying a lot. And our brother Buck Singh um, learned a lot about prayer, praying for my life partner. And so, I, that, and I said, if if you know, if God can bring someone to India. So when Heather wrote to me, then that idea, I was struck right away by her the dedication to God. I didn't know her except seeing her once or twice. But I thought that by that time I was used to arrange weddings in India where people didn't even meet their partners till they got married. So I thought, well, you know, if God wants this, then he will do it if God wants this. And at that time, too, I was thinking about my parents who did not understand what I was doing. And so I just prayed and prayed, and yes, God opened the door um, when she wrote, and I, after a few weeks and months of prayer, I, I asked God, uh, will this be the person for me? And if God wants, if God can bring her to India, then I know this is the person for me. Just like when um, God opened the door for Abraham's servant to find Rebecca for him, I thought God can do this for me too. And so that was the beginning. More later? First, Heather's part. Well, I didn't know much about India, but one of my concerns was that my parents would approve. They didn't approve of me going to Bible school. They didn't approve of most things in my life. They didn't like my artwork. They didn't like a lot of other things. So I thought, this is a real test of the Lord, that my parents would say yes and not ask questions because I had no answers except that I knew this was what God wanted for me. And when I wrote and told my parents that I wanted to marry this man, that I was going out to India, they said yes and didn't ask questions. There had been many other obstacles along the way, but to me, this was one of the biggest obstacles that proved to me this was all in God's plan. Now, Bert's plan was that I would have come a lot earlier than I did. On the next plane. <laughs> right away. <laughs> but I wasn't in as big a hurry as Bert. I, needed, I was older. I was older. I needed to finish that semester of school. And so I prayed also about spending the summer on OM in Europe. And God closed the door. And I thought, okay, Lord, you know what you're doing. And I ended up working with the North American Indian Mission down in the United States in a small Indian village. Actually, it was a clerical. First Nations. It was a, a clerical error that caused my, my friend and I to be there. There was just two of us girls in this little village. But it was the greatest summer I've ever had. And that girl and I are still very close friends today. And she lives in, in Edmonton. And while I was there, most of our mail got returned. For some reason, the, even the American post office seemed to have problems finding this village. <laughs> but one letter that got through was from Brother Buck Singh inviting me to come to India. And I wouldn't have told anyone at that time. I didn't even have money to get back to Canada. But a friend who knew that I was in this village, she was working farther down the coast and she came up, and when she left, 
and I went to make the bed. She had left money under the pillow for me. And that got me back to Canada. And it was amazing to see how God worked all the details then for me to go to India. Even being in Europe, I got as far as Belgium. And then I realized I probably didn't have the money to fly to Europe, uh, to fly to India. But I thought, no, I'll pray about this. I don't need to discuss this with other people. I can talk to my Lord. And I told the Lord about the situation, and his answer was, my mercies are new every morning. And so I had peace in my heart. And so the next evening when I went to the airlines, I asked them how much in American money, because I had American cash with me, how much is it in American money to fly to India? And they quoted $14 less than what I had in my pocket. I hadn't even thought about the fact I have to travel halfway across India. I will need some money, or I needed money for anything else. Bert's already told you about my flight. I flew to Bombay. In fact, I'd been in Bombay three days before they sent a telegram to tell Bert I was arriving the next morning in Hyderabad. <laughs> so uh, part of my story was um, I have also my own fears and, and barriers. And one of them was my parents, who thought I was totally crazy when they heard about um, uh, this, tra this uh, marriage in India. They didn't even know who she was. And um, so they, they said, uh, you know, if you're normal, like, like we, gave you, we gave you some brains when you were born, why don't you come back home and get to meet this girl and then have a wedding where the families can join? You know, I says, yeah, that's the easy way. That's the easy way. There's all letters, by the way, no phone calls, all letters. You have to wait for three weeks before you, you know, they get the answer back. It took nine days, Norman, for a letter. <laughs> okay. But he would be on the road. So, uh, so Even the answer to his proposal, he tells people it took three months. I got the letter the 31st of January. Because he was traveling in February, he got the answer March 1st. That's three months, right? <laughs> yeah. January, February, March. In reality, four weeks. So it was, it, so first of all, my, my parents, to overcome their hesitations, they were so engrossed with their farm. I would tell, I would tell people that the farm, and they would tell people later that the farm was their God. And they had small children, and they had, and they had to work hard, and and um, and so so the, there was very few times in the year when the farmers could even have the time. Plus, my father never traveled except it took him 19 years to go back to Holland to see his family when he came to immigrate. He's an immigrant that came to Canada with with two little kids, including me, and when uh, we were two and three years old. So my parents. So my parents. Yes, they loved God. They prayed for me. But they, when I told them that a thousand people might come to the wedding, they said, "Don't exaggerate, like you always do in your letters." They had a thousand pigs, but a thousand people. How could they? On the prairies of Alberta, it takes a long time to get a thousand people in one place. So, so, and and I prayed. I said, "God, the only way they can really understand if they ever if they come, and maybe the wedding will make them come." And then, of course, to see how God uh, had to supply the needs for Heather to come to India on a one-way ticket, not thinking of going back. I knew that God was bringing her. So, but um, finally, my parents, um, we prayed a lot. People in India prayed. And my parents said, yes, you, you, we met her now. We inv I told them, that you, why don't you invite her to your house for a, a week? She only lives 90 miles away. So they invited to her to the house for a week. She stayed with my parents. And then my father gave her a gift. And my father and mother uh, said, uh, she's a good cook. You, she can go to India. And we approve of her. So they approved of her. But don't get, expect us to come. And so it was a miracle even for my parents to finally a month before we were getting married that they said they would arrive and come to the wedding. And they had just arrived. They had major problems getting there because I told them about a cheap airline, which, uh, which didn't really work out in Belgium. And so they were stuck in Belgium for five days. I heard from my brother by letter from Canada that my parents had left before my parents arrived in India. And I was getting, and it's only on March the 7th that my parents arrived the day before we were getting married. 
actually, even when they arrived in India, it was the first time in history that Indian Airlines was on strike. Yeah, when they arrived, in, when they arrived in Bombay, Indian Airlines was on strike. And so uh, the Ormers had to pick them up and take them on the overnight train journey. To, and they had been on the road for so many, so many days. But it was an answer to prayer. And um, our letters, uh, as we went over, it was my parents turning around in India that turned their lives around for Jesus. And they saw 2,000 people at the wedding. And there was, and when they went back from Hyderabad, I remember about 100 people going to the train station to say goodbye to my parents. And when they arrived in Calgary, Alberta, my one brother was waiting for them. And so the, 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 the overwhelming thing is that they dedicated their lives to missions and to God in a new way because of their trip to India. So these are some of the fears I had. And another big fear, I went to Brother Buck Singh one day and said, how many people will you expect? He says, well, a whole church wants to come. And I've invited people from other assemblies. So, you know, and if you invite someone from India, they'll invite their uncles and aunts and cousins. So you got to expect at least a thousand. I says, now my first question as a, as a Dutch Canadian that thinks about money was where the money going to come from? Uh, where's the money? And I, I said, Buck Singh, um, I had $10 in my pocket, maybe. That's all I had. I had a small, tiny little suitcase of one change of clothes, my wife says, before I got married. And so I had nothing. And I just said, I, he said, you got to expect a thousand people. And I said, I said, Brother Buck Singh, we're going to just invite maybe uh, 10 people, just 10 people, just to fit my pocketbook. I didn't say my pocketbook, but I said, I, he looked at me and said, Bert, this is India. We want to preach the gospel at your wedding. We know there's many non-Christians that might come. And your parents are coming, and you drove a truck to India, and God is still, that truck is still going, a secondhand truck from the garbage dump. And now you guys prayed for an ocean-going ship, and the Lord provided the ship for a bunch of young people. If He brings, He's bringing your wife to India now. If He's, can He? If He, if a thousand come, people come to the wedding, can't He feed them? Go back to your room and pray some more. I was rebuked. I was humbled, and I realized that that wasn't God's way. That God wanted to bring everybody we could, we could invite, including the shuk. My one of my Indian friends wrote a note this week. He says, "Bert, I remember at your wedding." Even the shoe cobbler that fixed your shoes came to the wedding. He said, I remember that distinctly. The shoe cobbler was there from outside the gates. And so, and then when the wedding came, yes, I still had ten dollars. Had to pray for this ring that Heather has on her hand. Brother Apogee, who gave Hebron to, to Brother Buck Singh, who was just living in a small room, was praying for us, and I became one of his friends. He was an old man, and I he says, What can I do for your your wife's birthday and your wedding that's coming up. I says, well, you can, well, you can, um, well, I says, well, yeah, we're praying for a ring. I don't have, and I think a woman should have a ring. In India, they have other things, but in the in Western world, women have a ring to mean they're married. He says, and I said, that will last our whole life. And he says, that's what I want to get you guys for your wedding. And so he paid the $10 in Indian rupees that it costs a gold ring. I just got her another one for her 50th out of gold and diamond, and that cost a little bit more than $10. <laughs> I, I, but God, and when I got married, we started, people from India, instead of giving us gifts, they gave us cash, rupees. Some, one lady came from Pune, took a whole week off. One lady came from the military just to come to our wedding, and they brought us cash, and when we counted it, it was three times the amount that we needed to pay for the food, $150 for the food at that time. The people in the church cooked the food. And we had something like $600 from people from India that gave us. I said, well, Lord, why didn't I invite more people to the wedding? <laughs> and uh, so that was part of how God, uh, God overcome and saw us and all the, the practical things of um, our needs. Continue on. Where's the honeymoon? And, uh, <laughs> well, actually, we could tell many more stories about India and our experiences there, um, but we won't because we we know you want to get home for lunch eventually. <laughs> 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 well, when I arrived, I lived in the guest house and I helped in the office and I taught Bible to women's groups out in the suburb areas. In the beginning, it was a little daunting 
because I was Bert's bride and everybody had known Bert for three years. So everybody wanted to do everything. I used to hide out so I could do some things for myself because I felt embarrassed that people would grab my clothes and go wash them or do other stuff for me. So I quickly figured out systems to avoid this because I thought they don't do it for each other. Why are they doing it for me? I'm not helpless. I love the food. In fact, after four months in India, Brother Buck Singh had asked me if I would go and help a missionary lady that Bert knew. And she provided salmon sandwiches, and I got sick because I'd only eaten Indian food for four months. And Bert and I still love it. But probably the hardest, the hardest thing to do was leaving India. After our honeymoon, Bert wants me to tell you a little bit about that. We took Bert's parents on a trip to visit South India. I hadn't been either, so we went to Bangalore, Balur, Madras, and then on our way back. By train. By train. And on our way back, we stopped in Gudur. But in Madras, Bert sent um, a telegram. And his dad says, you're crazy. We're only stopping for half an hour in Gadur. You can't. Nobody's going to come to the train, especially at that hour of the morning. 7.30 or whatever. Seven I don't know. 7 o'clock. To, to visit you. Well, the entire church were in Gadur at 7 a.m. because it was for, before work time. And they brought gifts and said, we also made you lunch. Well, it took the four of us two days to eat all that lunch. <laughs> They treated us so well. And as Bert mentioned, it was a highlight for his parents and a life-changing experience. But for me, we realized when we were back that now we didn't really have a job at Hebron anymore. And Bert was keen to go visit the ship and to return to Canada because he would have been away for five years at that time. But for me, it was very difficult. It's the first place that I felt really loved. And leaving India was the first time in my life I experienced homesickness. And I missed the people. We joined the ship, which uh, OM ship Logos. We spent six months on the ship. Bert helped in the exhibition. and. I did cooking and cleaning and sewing and various things. From there, we, we felt God wanted us to go back to Belgium. Bert had worked in Belgium. Actually, we ended up both spending three, year, three more years there. But in always in this time, in the back of my mind was, Lord, when are we going back to India? This was home for me. And Bert had been on a trip to Canada on a speaking trip, and he came back and said, I feel God wants us to go to Canada, and I just felt sick. I just thought, no way. All these people in North America who do not want to go to the mission field, and now you're telling me you want me back home? This is not right. Finally, Bert said, if you don't have peace, we're not going. And that's when I thought, Lord, this is not right. And I prayed, and God said to me, what changes if you go to Canada? What is your job? Well, my job is to look after my husband, my children. At that time, we had two children that had been born in Belgium, and I was expecting a third one. And then whatever else the Lord would give me to do. So even if God was out of, even if Bert was out of God's will, I knew I was not. I was doing what God wanted me to do. And in fact, we were back in Canada for seven years before we made our first trip back to India. And in India, somebody asked me, well, Bert and I were both there, and God, the person said, are you interested in coming back to India? Would you like to come back and work here? And I said, no. Because it was like God took the curtain and pulled it back and said, but you can do more for India here in Canada than you can do in India. We were recruiting young people to go out because we could share our experience here. Other people gave us money, so we were able to support our brothers and sisters that worked with OM in India. And this, and so we've been in Canada ever since. We've made several trips 
to India since then, and we would like to go back. We had planned on going back in um, 2018, but the door closed at that time because Modi had threatened some of the Christians, and the young the man that we were going to go and work with in Silgary said, the government has told me that if you even show up, they will close me down, and we're the only school for all the Bible school for all the tribal people. So we felt we have put a lot of time and money into that project. We don't want it closed down, so we didn't go. But we're praying, and they are praying again that we can come and be at that school. We'll also go and visit Hebron and a few other places on the way. I want to share one more story about India um, that involved our honeymoon trip. The Honeymoon in Western world is, you know, you leave your family behind and just go and spend time by yourselves. But my parents had arrived the day before, and you, we couldn't, we couldn't leave them by themselves. They would never have survived. So they were. With they us. hardly survived the food. Yeah. They'd never eaten any kind of spice in their my life. I was sick half the time actually, and almost didn't go back, get on the plane to go back to India. So, so, um, but. Um, one, so you know, it was a, a rough time. In for first two or three weeks with my, always with my parents. I hadn't seen my mother for three years, so and she's going back soon. So I thought I need to spend a lot of time with her. And my, one day, my wife asked me if I was married to my mother or to her. There was a little crisis going on with our relationship, and you know, and they and my mother actually uh, heard about baptism in Hebron um, the same week that we got married, and she got baptized that week in Hebron. That was a really huge experience. She never got baptized when my dad did, so that was a, a big step forward. But then the other trip is we had to go to the OM conference and go to North India uh, with our truck after my, uh, after my parents left. And we had to go through Delhi and Lucknow with our truck. And that was part of our honeymoon experience, but part of OM experience as well. And we had always been praying in Hebron for a, a, a leading evangelist in Nepal called Debel Singh. He was one of Buck Singh's co-workers, but he, he went, won a lot of Nepalis to Jesus. And he was put in prison because he was converting them. It was against the law. And he was put in the worst prison in Nepal for political prisoners. And there he had Bible studies with them and was when, in fact, later he got kicked out of prison because he led so many people to Jesus in that prison. But while he was in, we had prayed for him in Hebron. I never knew him, but in luck now, I met on our honeymoon trip with our truck. We were going to spend some time. Oh, there was an, another missionary that had a correspondence course in India, and they lived, they were from Australia, and they lived on the Nepal border. And they said, we are gone. You guys can have our house for a couple of weeks just to be together. So we thought, this is great. We can finally just be, you know, in India, to be by yourself when there's so many people around you. So we thought, this is great to have these, this uh, wonderful time after Lucknow. But in Lucknow, we met this wife and the son of Debel Singh. And they, and a daughter, another daughter, too. Yeah. Three of them. And the older was four. And, and, and the, the only the way, mother. okay, and the only way to get to Nepal, to their prison, to bring supplies to them was through India. To, and then that's, that's where, as far as the road stopped, they would have to walk across the border, bring the supplies, and then come back, and then our truck had to go to Nepal. Um, they also had all their furniture, and we needed to take them all the way into Pokhara. Pokhara. They lived in Pokhara. So they said, oh, you guys came in the right time to help this wonderful family. So you got your truck. It's empty. You can put all the furniture. You can put this family. You can bring the supplies to this prison, to this, pr prison, this guy in prison. I thought, yeah, the, another, another um, week with we're not by ourselves. Well, it shouldn't have taken a week, except for the fact that when we got to the river. To go to Pokhara. To go to Pokhara. There is a river crossing, and it's only a pontoon bridge. Well, it started raining, and the river started rising, so we couldn't cross the river. The truck is jammed with furniture. And there's four of us, five, sorry, there's six of us to sleep in this truck on top, piled on top of the furniture. We Ven eventually, the water came down enough we were able to go to Pokhara. To Pokhara. Pokhara's beautiful. We also counted the hairpin bends because.
because I'm getting a little tired of them. So we figured out in the 120 mile trip that road had 1,100 hairpin bends. It's like wind up down the mountain, up the mountain. So down now, the mountain. now our days are almost gone. And now we're coming back from Pokhara. And guess what? Just before that river, there's a landslide on the weekend when no vehicles are. So all the vehicles got pushed back. And there was a big landslide covering the whole highway. No work was going to get done till the weekend was over. So On top of that, we had no water, no tea, nothing. Peanut butter sandwiches. Peanut, peanut, dry bread and peanut butter. <laughs> so, so we sent a, a Sikh driver up ahead with money to buy tea for us at the, at the, at the, at the river. And finally, uh, two or three days later, they got the road cleared. And then we finally reached that missionary home. And yeah. Ooh. We had two days. Two days <laughs> instead of two weeks. We had two days there. And this shows you, of course, India, you have to be flexible, patience, and you know, adjust to the new situation. What a joy to help this family where the son actually has been serving God for a number of years with Operation Mobilization. And we were able to be an encouragement to that family in prison. But it was not, it was an interruption to our beautiful arranged <laughs> honeymoon trip. So our lives have been part of that kind of thing. Uh, even today, my wife does not know what's happening in our lives. I keep something secret. <laughs> Normally, he doesn't. Usually, he spills everything. <laughs> okay. Slowly learning. Okay, so but I think a couple of things in closing. One of the biggest things I think I learned in India was hospitality. I love the hospitality of the people and the openness. And in fact, it got to the point where sometimes traveling, we snuck through town late at night because we didn't have time to stop. And if you stop, you must stay for tea. <laughs> and if you stay for tea, then you should stay for something to Dinner. eat. And then how come you can't stay for the next meal as well? And, and if overnight. you need a bed, you can stay overnight. <laughs> so occasionally, we did do that wherever we could. Occasionally, and I did not let people know I was coming through their city because I knew what was going to happen. We drove at night <laughs> because we had to get to the next destination. But, you know, it's something we've carried through in our own ministry is to have that open door we learned about in India. And we saw the dedication of the people and thought, the only way we can repay the people of India is to do what they have done for us. Open their doors, open their hearts, showed us Jesus. And that was our goal for the rest of our lives. We work now with international students. And so we're able to show them the kind of hospitality many of them are used to in their own country. Um, I, I put down here, just in, in a note here, that 20 years ago, we, we got opened the door for us to work with international students. And again, I had tremendous fears. We all have fears. My fear was, I'm not, I've never been to university. I've been to Bible school. I don't know anything about computer science. or. or uh, he couldn't even turn a computer on in those days. I still don't turn on her computer. <laughs> I do, do everything with my cell phone now. It's amazing. Some students actually saw that I, I was high tech now. But... Um, <laughs> Heather's going to close because I'm answering this just a surprise visitor coming in. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> but part of the reason, to, one of the things we realize is these kids didn't need somebody with a ton of education. They needed people with an open heart who would um, give them a home away from home, who could love them and share with them Jesus Christ. And... I'm going to read Bert's last part here. So our desire, even now, we are still in full-time ministry. Our desire is to press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of us. Brothers and sisters, we do not consider ourselves yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing we do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, we will press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs>